So systems engineering is not offered in most universities. It's very, very underrated, and that's one of the reasons. So if you can't actually take it as a major or study it in college, how the hell do you become a systems engineer? And why is being a systems engineer such a cool and underrated thing? These are the things that I'm gonna be answering in this video. I'm gonna to explain to you what systems engineering is, how you can become a systems engineer, but more importantly, is it even the right thing for you? Is it what you should spend your finite time on this earth doing? If you don't know who I am, my name is Ali al Karagouli. I am a systems engineer and a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And I actually did my PhD on systems engineering. So I started out in electrical engineering as a bachelor student, and then during my master's was also in electrical engineering. And even though my PhD was within the electrical and computer engineering department, it had a strong focus on systems. So let's dive into it. But before I explain to you what systems engineering is, we probably should backtrack and understand what even is a system? What is a system, right? And you hear that word like all the time, right? Like there's a communication system, there's a nervous system, there's like system this, system that, control system. What is a system? Well, at the very fundamental level, a system is just a bunch of components working together to achieve some type of goal, okay? So if you were to look at any system that is possible, for example, my nervous system in my body right now, all the nerves are working together to send signals such that I can coordinate, such that I can think, such that I can do these kind of things. For example, a soccer team or a football team or a basketball team, that is a system. It is made up of different components, which are the players who are working together to achieve a common goal, which is win the game. So if that is what a system is, and a system is that simple, well, why, why is there all this complexity around systems? Well, there are different kinds of systems. Uh, for example, in the context of electrical engineering, there are control systems, and these systems usually have feedback. So for example, if I'm trying to have some input going into some type of process, and it produces an output, I can systemize this by connecting this and having feedback. And then I have two different components here that using the feedback are constantly relating to one another, right? And the control system in this case is trying to achieve some type of goal, some type of outcome. Common example of this is your thermostat. If you have like central heating or air conditioning, for example, you set it to like, I don't know, 72, 70 degrees, and you basically use the feedback from the sensors that it's getting and it works as hard as it can to actually make it that. So what is systems engineering then? Well, systems engineering is basically the engineering of systems. And again, if in this case, we're looking at different components being integrated together, what a systems engineer is doing is looking at different components within some type of product, some type, any physical thing that they are building, could be non-physical as well, it could be software, and they are ensuring that all the parts are designed to work well together, and that they do work well together and are well integrated to achieve some type of common goal. Now, there are some misconceptions about systems engineering. A lot of people think uh, systems engineers um, just like don't do anything. They just look at, they're just jacks of all trades. They don't have depth of knowledge in, in anything specific. And I think that is not true at all because a very good systems engineer does not start out as a systems engineer. You start out having a really deep understanding of some type of component. And then once you have a good understanding of that component, you then zoom out and see how it interfaces with other components. And I'm gonna give you a very simple example, which is my PhD. So. When I started my PhD, I was very, very interested in satellite communications. Um, I actually, it's actually a really funny story. Uh, I was finishing up my undergrad. I had done my first NASA internship when I was a junior. And while I was at that NASA internship, I thought space was really cool. And there I learned about control systems. Uh, it was a PID control system, um, which I'll get into later in the video. But basically, I really got interested in space. And then when I went back, I wanted to study abroad. And then uh, there was a professor in my department was the head of the study abroad, who was also an engineering professor. And I saw his work, it looked really cool. He was working on high-speed communication systems. I was interested in space. And then after I studied abroad in Spain and he helped me do that, when I came back, I decided I should work with this professor. And uh, then my PhD topic became high-speed communication systems in space. So when I started looking at it from a system level, um, I was basically looking at communication systems as a whole. So my task was pretty simple. It was, I have two satellites in space. Picture that these are satellites and picture that this is like planet Earth and this is space. And they have two antennas and they are trying to talk to each other, right? 
Now, what my PhD advisor was working on at the time was a technology that allows these guys to talk to each other really, really fast, uh, hence using terahertz technology. We were doing that, he was, he was trying to do it at like 100 gigahertz all the way up to 10 terahertz. Now, the reason why when you go up in frequency, you get higher speed because you have higher available bandwidth, which means you can equip more information on the waves. If that sounds too complicated, don't worry about it. But the idea is my advisor was trying to do this here on Earth, and he was trying to do it in cellular systems. And then I, I, I talked to him and I said, hey, why don't we do this in space? And he was like, sure, let's, let's give it a shot. So then my project became, I have a task, I have a job, which is how do I make these two satellites talk to each other very, very fast in space? So my initial strength in components was that I had a bachelor's in electrical engineering and I was doing a master's in electrical engineering as well. So I was really good at understanding circuits. I was good at understanding electromagnetics and I was good at understanding a little bit of antennas as well, right? But the way I became a systems engineer is I couldn't just work on one of these things. I basically had a common goal that I wanted to achieve, which is I want to make a compelling case for why satellites at 100 gigahertz and above can produce high data rate communication in space. And that's what I was trying to achieve. So then once I set that goal, I take a look at the entire system because again, this satellite has things inside it. It has a computer, it has a battery, it has like a, a processing unit, it has communication links, it has sensors, it has actuators, um, it has like a bunch of other, uh, it, has, it has mechanical and thermal control systems that are making sure that it's pointing in the right place, it's like the right temperature and all that. Uh, and then on the ground, you have like a ground antenna that looks like this, that's like a massive dish and it's talking to this guy. Um, these are all different components within the system. So I couldn't just say, oh, just, I don't know, let me just focus on one component. I had to figure out how to make this entire system work. Thus, I had to go and understand each one of the different components. So that's exactly what I did. My very first few papers started with doing an overview of like, can this technology actually work in space? And yes, if so, why can't it? If no, why can't it? And once I figure out whether that technology can work in space or not, which I went ahead and did that. I compared it to a competing technology, which was lasers, published a paper on that. I, com I compared it to another competing technology, which was like below 100 gigahertz, stuff that's like 40, 50, 30 gigahertz, KA, KU band. Again, if you don't know what that is, no worries. I cover it in my uh, future more detailed videos about electronics communication systems. But the idea is I had to make this work and I started with these things. But once I did the overview and I figured out what is the problem with the business, I was able to identify bottlenecks. So I immediately figured out that, okay, uh, we don't have high gain antennas that are good enough at these frequencies. That is bottleneck number one. And if I'm gonna uh, try to use the same antenna for both transmit and receive, then I need that antenna to be like bi-directional, which means in here, I either need some type of switch or some type of diplexer, some type of circulator, some type of components that allows me to use the same antenna for both transmit and receive. And thus, this was bottleneck number two. Right? Bottleneck num and then I figured out, okay, well, this is the case for two satellites. What happens if you put many of them? What do the links need to look like? What, do, what does the network need to look like? There was no clear network that was available. And that was bottleneck number three. And then as a result, what I went ahead and did is I addressed each one of these bottlenecks in a paper. Basically, I went and I designed newer, cooler antennas that are deployable, higher gain. And that was check, component, done. I went ahead and I made a paper about a circulator that would make it possible to transmit and receive using the same antenna. That was a check. I went ahead and wrote a paper about how to design and simulate a network with one of my colleagues who was very, very talented. He built a tool that helped us simulate this stuff with software. And that was a check. And then, then we ran into another issue is that uh, we couldn't get funding for this. It was very hard to get this idea across because NASA was very invested in lasers other companies like SpaceX um, and some of the private uh, companies as well were either invested in lasers or KA, KU systems. So we needed to come up with a more compelling reason for how do we get it tested and launched and sent into space. And then we came up and then that was another bottleneck is that the bottleneck is, okay, you have a communication system, but can it, can it do more? And we came up with the idea of what we call JCS, Joint Communication and Sensing. And what we found out is around these frequencies, um, organizations like NASA um, do a lot of science. They do spec spectroscopy, but they also use it for radars since there are like molecules that they can study uh, around those frequencies. Basically, this same technology can be built for scientific purposes, not just for communication. Even though the communication can help science because if you have a spacecraft, 
that's achieving a science goal that can send higher data rates. Of course, that's a good thing. But then that was another bottleneck. And then guess what? We solved that bottleneck as well. We wrote a paper that designs a JCS system that basically explains that, okay, you can have the same transmitter and the same receiver. And then internally, you can configure your circuit in a certain way and using software and using hardware that you can um, be able to switch between radar configuration, sensing configuration to uh, communication configuration. And we actually won a grant for it. And that's part of why I was able to come here uh, to NASA as a postdoc, uh, is that now we are actually trying to build this thing. And now we're like, hopefully soon we'll be able to launch it. We have a scheduled launch date, 2027. So it's crazy, like something that started five or six years ago as a mere concept is only able to move forward and be closer to launch because there was a systems engineer who was able to look at all the different components, see what all the different problems were, figure out the solutions to each one of the problems although they were in different domains. Now keep in mind, for an antenna paper or to design and build an antenna, you need to understand electromagnetics, you need to understand simulation tools. There's a lot of things you need to do. To learn about circulators or to learn about hardware or to learn about mixers or multipliers and things like that, you need to dive deeper into the electronics and, and understand how these things work. To understand a flight computer and how it interfaces it and, and what kind of data it can send. You need to understand software. You need to know how to write code in Python and to simulate the whole system, you need to write code in something like MATLAB and be able to run simulation code. And now, once you have designed this antenna that's very cool, that's gonna deploy from your system, you need to actually build it and see what are the constraints on it mechanically. Thus, you need to also understand mechanics. So I can't just be an electrical engineer who's like, yeah, like I'll let the mechanical engineer worry about it. No, I have to understand how is this thing gonna be manufactured? Who's gonna manufacture it? What's the cost? What is the design? How is it gonna deploy? Is it going to break? Is it going to bend? If, if I do this, what kind of material needs to be used? These are all questions I need to answer. And mind you, my bachelor's was in electrical engineering. It was not in mechanical engineering. It was not material science. But that's what a good systems engineer is supposed to do. A good systems engineer is someone who's supposed to go learn everything that is there that needs to be learned and take full ownership of the entire system. And if you don't know something, you go ask an expert. Like the way I learned all these things is through reading books, reading papers, and talking to people, asking people an infinite amount of questions. So that's basically a, a brief journey of how I became a systems engineer and how I was able to transition from working only on a component to becoming someone who was very, very systems focused, which was very attractive for a lot of companies, and a lot of organizations, including NASA, which is why I was able to come here. Now, there's a reason why, now you may ask, okay, well, so why is this not offered as an undergrad? Like, why did I, like, it seems like systems engineering is something that you can't like, quote, study. It seems like it's something you have to kind of learn, right? And there's a good reason for that. I think to an extent, like 50%, that's a good thing. 50%, that's a bad thing. And to, towards the end of the video, I'm going to explain to you a proposal I have where we can fix that. Um, is that as a systems engineering, you really need core expertise in one area. You really need to be very good at one thing. You need to be very good at either mechanics or electromagnetics or software, at least. Like you need to be extremely good at one of those areas. For me, it was electromagnetics. It was electrical engineering and from there, I learned a lot about software, and then I learned about mechanical stuff as well. You really want to be full stack, but in order for you to be full stack, like if this is um, me being full stack, or like let's say, I don't know, I have like EE, like ME, software, and then like some other skill that I, that I need to learn, for example, I don't know, budgeting, things like that. Um, I really need a foundation here. In my case, it's electrical engineering. So if you're someone who's interested in becoming a system engineer, you really need one core foundation in one area. Because if you're only looking at things from the top and you don't have a deep understanding of how things actually work, uh, you're not gonna be a good system engineer because you can only see things 2D. You can't actually, when things break, you won't be able to dive in and solve any problem. As a system engineer, you should be able to solve like any problem, like thermal, mechanical, chemical, electrical, anything that comes up of that nature. And that's very, very uh, important. So. The other idea um, behind, behind that is, is that you can't, you can't really study it as an undergrad because a lot of this stuff cannot really be taught. It can only be like learned through experience. There are some second order skills involved such as problem solving, like bottleneck identifying is what I call you first need to identify the problem before you can solve it. Uh, understanding how things are working together. Also something that systems engineers very commonly do is they come up with requirements. They ask the big questions of like, why are we doing this? Why should we do this? Why is this important and whatnot? It's something that you can't, like it's kind of really tough to learn in class. It's something you just learn from, from experience. 
And uh, you also need a very good foundation in physics, in my opinion. I think a really, really good systems engineer is someone who has a deep understanding of physics. Because any system that is made up of different components, all these components, eventually, all of it, all of it just boils down to physics. It all boils down to mechanics and electromagnetics. And um, if you understand, if you have a very deep understanding of physics, if you have a very deep understanding of very basic mechanics, like what makes something move, what makes something not move, uh, when does something bend, when does something uh, tilt, when does something like translate, when does it st stay still, because there's another force that's opposing it. Uh, like these are very basic ideas, but you need a deep understanding of the basics. The, the very best people um, are, have a very good understanding of the basics. So it's not that they know all the complicated, advanced, uh, new nuance. I don't even read a lot of the papers that come out and I can still solve almost any problem because I have a very deep understanding of the basics, right? And in the case of electromagnetics, you need a very deep understanding of Maxwell's equations. You need to be able to understand what is a charge, why does a charge exert an electric field, and when does a charge exert a, an electric field? Uh, we actually, the physicists are still trying to answer the first question. Um, and what happens when you move that charge? And why is there a magnetic field that is induced? And then when the magnetic field changes, why does that induce an electric field again? And um, why can't you have a magnetic field just on its own? Why is it always dependent on electri electricity? You need to understand these things. You need to understand charges, fields, waves. If you understand these things on a deep level, then electronics is easy. Antennas is easy. Circulators is easy. Because you have built yourself such a great foundation that anything else that sits on top would be absolutely fantastic. So I, um, the last thing I want to end with is while this is basically a roadmap for how you can become a systems engineer in terms of like you pick one area that you find interesting, you become really good at it, and then you slowly branch out into learning about other components. One thing I have proposed to my PhD advisor, who is currently a professor at Northeastern University, is that we come up with a systems engineering master's program. I know some universities have it, but they probably would not have it as good as I have it in mind. Um, and I, what I want you to do is I want you, uh, if you, if, if you like systems engineering and you like this idea, I want you to like this video and I want you to leave a comment uh, asking, saying why you think a master's program in systems engineering would be very valuable. Uh, even if you don't decide to take it upon yourself, why would it be variable uh, to other students? Then I can take all these comments and show it to my former PhD advisor and maybe he would actually listen to me. So <laughs> that's uh, the case. If you enjoyed this, uh, uh, this video, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, I will see you guys uh, in the next one. Peace, love.